welcome to the show where we share the stories of the many who intersect with our healthcare system but are rarely heard from. My name is Kevin Poe, founder and editor of Kevin MD. Today in the show, we have Lauren Powers. She is a critical care nurse and she wrote the Kevin MD article, I am an ICU nurse. We are drowning. Lauren, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Kevin. So we'll get into your article in a little bit, but first off, can you share your story and journey to where you are today? Sure. So I was born and raised in New England. I took a pretty traditional route through nursing. I got my bachelor's degree from Worcester State University. I practiced for a little bit in a new grad program out there at a big level one trauma. My first unit was a cardiothoracic med surge floor with a very high acuity, which kind of triggered my love for cardiac nursing. From there, I went to a local community hospital, started on their step-down unit and progressed to the ICU where I kind of found my niche, where I've been there for about three or four years now. I also did a brief stint at a big level one teaching hospital in Boston in the cardiac ICU there. So tell me what kind of characteristics and traits should a nurse have if he or she is interested in working in a critical care unit? Sure. So that is a question I think that people will universally have an answer to. Extreme attention to detail, empathy, being able to bounce back after very difficult scenarios, critical thinking. There's a lot of autonomy that goes into being an ICU nurse and you're tasked with a lot of management of every medication, every device could potentially save or kill somebody. And that attention to detail and that ability to use your clinical judgment is super important. So take us into shoes of a typical day when you talk about the complexity of, of your critical care duties. Some of us may not be familiar with that just by you saying it. So give us an example of, of some of the complex situations that, that you would typically see in the ICU. So a typical day in the ICU, often I'm tasked with being in charge. We have patients frequently coming and going. There is no pushback if they are critically ill, if they have perhaps cardiac arrested on the floor, we're the team that responds to that. Typically the ones that are running the code, stabilizing the patient, bringing them down. And I recall specifically on night shift, we had one night where we had STEMI activation after STEMI activation, and we wound up with three mechanical circulatory support devices on our unit in a small community hospital at two in the morning. With that, we are the ones that are familiar with the device. We're tasked with how to troubleshoot, what looks right, what looks wrong. Our physicians are primarily intensivists, pulmonologists by nature, and they are phenomenal, but they are also not cardiologists. So a lot of that, especially at a community hospital, falls on you as the nurse. There is no perfusionist. You are the perfusionist overnight. I remember one situation, I had a balloon pump after, you know, my first one that he was oozing from a groin site incessantly. He had just gotten to the unit at shift change. I got a helium loss alarm on a balloon, which is a level one alarm, meaning the device will completely power down. It's a balloon that sits in the aorta. So without that pumping every so often, it completely can just shower clots. So this is an emergency. And I remember taking alcohol swabs and wiping the helium drive line of the balloon pump to tell if the blood was on the inside or the outside of the device. While we were doing that, there were probably about five other nurses. Everybody knows their role. All the things that you think, oh, we should start doing this. There's somebody already on the other side of the bed doing exactly what you're thinking. Everybody jumps into gear. We ended up stabilizing the patient by troubleshooting. We FaceTimed the device rep at two in the morning at the bedside. And we walked it through. The patient ended up being okay. But there, there isn't much for our intensivists to do. You know, that's all falls on the responsibility of the nurse. On top of titrating multiple medications, continuous medications to achieve hemodynamic instability, notifying family, consoling them, many conflicting situations with family members and futility. And, you know, just because we can, does it mean that we should? There are a lot of ethical dilemmas that the nurse kind of coordinates as well. And you talk more about your experiences as a critical care nurse in the Kevin MD article. 
I am an ICU nurse. We are drowning. Now, for those who didn't get a chance to read your article, can you just walk my audience through it and share the story of why you decided to write it? Sure. So firstly, writing has always been an outlet for me. You need to have an outlet in this job. You can't bottle things up and you can't internalize everything. You need to have a way to express it and get it off your mind onto paper. And that was my way of doing that. In this article, I actually can still remember it like it was yesterday, which is odd because it's been about two years since I've written it. And it was just word vomit onto a piece of paper after an incredibly hard shift that I couldn't process. And I'm surprised by how close in time it feels to the actual event, even reading it back now, because those memories just kind of stick with you. It was the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, probably about maybe two months in, where we're a small community hospital that was hit in particularly hard by COVID. Mm. Uh, fewer resources. We surged to five ICUs when we really didn't have the staff for two. We were operating in all negative pressure unit with all patients on mechanical ventilation with COVID, full PPE gear for hours. And it was a really taxing situation for everybody in healthcare, but in particularly our unit. Mm -hmm. We were designated between the two ICUs to be the COVID specific ICU. At first it was just a lot of, you know, PUIs or patients under investigation. And I remember coming onto the unit because we were changing our scrubs when we were caring for COVID patients, which is laughable now, you know, you couldn't go into a, a negative person's room mm -hmm. if you were caring for a COVID patient and you had somebody designated to watch you put on and take off PPE, which is mm -hmm. such a second nature thing now in retrospect, but it went from that and having all these resources to, okay, now we're getting extremely sick, classic COVID presentation patients that they aren't just under investigation and there's so many of them that you can't be that's not your only patient in fact we at one time had five icu patients and this night in particular was when everything came full circle and we all looked around realizing what happened mm -hmm. before you know it our all of our units room doors were closed and you know everybody is face down on their stomachs to help them breathe it was just such a sudden shift and that particular night was a big moment for a lot of us working on that unit. I have nurses that still tell me about, you know, I, I'll never forget that night. It was when it became so apparent to us that we didn't have the resources or the staff or the knowledge really to care for patients with this virus. And it was one of the few times that I truly felt that we could have done something differently if we had had those things. And I had never ethically been faced with it that head on, that sudden, and that realization really hit everybody. So as you reflect on that night with staff for only two ICUs, when you really had five ICUs running, how did you make it through that night? What are some of the, the, the tools that you used and relied on to, to get through that particular night? Like, how did you make it? Truth be told, I would have never been able to cope with that night or continue to work in this job if it wasn't for my coworkers. Mm -hmm. They are the only people that truly will ever understand what it feels like to be in that scenario. Other people can, you know, can have empathy, but they'll never truly know what it's like. And the support and love that I've gained from my coworkers, I, it's, you can't replace it. And they made it so I didn't feel alone. On top of the fact, after the fact, sharing the article and seeing everybody's reaction, especially from my own hospital, and then reaching, you know, thousands and thousands of shares, which I had never anticipated, and seeing everybody else's reaction, you know, it. One of my coworkers actually submitted an article that was accepted by you, Kevin, and I was telling her how great of a job she did and how well written it was, and. She had told me that, you know, I would never even build up the guts to write it and submit it if you hadn't sent yours in. So the support and the, you know, the, the bond that I formed with people that I don't even know and gained from sharing it, it was a really therapeutic experience for me. And your article did get shared 
more than thousands of times. I'm looking at it right now, 59,000 times and clearly struck a chord and resonated with the entire healthcare community. So give us an example of some of that feedback that you received from people that you didn't even know in response to your article. A lot of it was you taking the words right from my mouth. And mm. I think in that there was a togetherness that I felt that even though this was such a detailed description of such a specific night that it resonated with so many people. Thank you for saying the words that I can't. P people that I didn't even know in departments in my own hospital reached out to me specifically and just, it felt good to have that recognition of the care and the standard of care that I provide. And I received a lot of loving messages about the care I provided for that patient in general and how much I really pour into my patients. And it felt really good because it can be very taxing to emotionally invest that deeply into this job. But I've always found that that's where I find the most sacred connections is by giving everything that I have. And it felt really good to know that I was, I was a bit more at peace with the situation knowing it's clear that I did give everything that I had and it, sometimes it just isn't enough, but to know that in solidarity, there are so many other people feeling the same way was a super therapeutic experience. So clearly this story and that night has changed you forever. In what ways has it changed you as a nurse? I'd love to sit and say that it's made me better. I don't know that that's entirely true. I've gained a lot of insight into my own emotions and writing, but it's also changed healthcare for me. Mm -hmm. That was the marker of the night that everything changed from pre-COVID to just life as we know it now. Um, at this point, I think I'm just so, like so many other healthcare providers, emotionally exhausted. We went 19 months before not having a single COVID patient in our ICU. So from that night, while everybody else is, you know, getting back to life, that's an important perspective to share that we spent those 17 months, you probably had a birthday or two, you know, and we were still caring for COVID patients day in and day out. And emotionally, I, I remember just feeling so frustrated at the system. I hate to use, you know, burnout and it's real. It's a real issue with any healthcare provider. And that night just shifted like, wow, I can't continue to do this. I needed to shift into self-perseverance and, you know, I'm finally tuning where to give and where to hold back. And I never wanted to do that in this job, but under the circumstances, I feel like that night made me realize that I need to, in order to continue doing a job that I love. We're talking to Lauren Powers. She's a critical care nurse. She wrote the Kevin MD article, I am an ICU nurse. We are drowning. Lauren, we're speaking now in the beginning of February, 2022. How are things now in the intensive care unit? There are peaks and valleys in any ICU of, you know, all of a sudden we're full with extremely sick patients. Patients come in waves of heart attacks or, you know, head bleeds. We get pretty much everything at this hospital. And for so long, it was solely COVID. We had numerous surges after the most recent variant. And, you know, we opened our surge space again. We were holding patients in the PACU again. We were holding patients, very critically ill patients in the cath lab with an impella intubated because there, were, there was no ICU nurse to take care of them. Now we still are you know, sprinkled with COVID. But at this point, it's a lot of just ethical issues of they've been riding this course and now we know so much more about COVID and, you know, how it progresses and, you know, just the pathophysiology of multi-organ failure. And we're seeing a lot of that. We're conflicted. We can only prone somebody for so long. We can only do so much. There's not 150% oxygen. There's only 100%. So we're navigating a lot of that where we're watching, you know, futility and that's hard too. you know, don't get me wrong. The busyness of the surge is, you know, you get a little bit of an adrenaline rush to get through it, but this is just kind of slowly watching in inevitable situation 
play out before you and you can't really do anything. So I think there's something to be said about how emotionally taxing that is as well. We're reading stories about the proverbial great resignation and how burnout and difficult work circumstances are causing a lot of healthcare professionals to leave clinical medicine. Now, how many nurses from that particular night are still working with you today? We had a very good crew on that night. That being said, three out of maybe six or seven. Mm -hmm. And you know what, Kevin, it is like arguably one of the most heartbreaking things that I've seen when you love this job and you love your work family so much and you see their love for their job and you see that just slowly leave them to a point that they're rethinking their whole life. I couldn't even tell you our staff right now is probably about 80% travel nurses, which mm -hmm. thank God for them, we would not function without them. But the number of people that I've seen come and go, and I've seen that light and spark that they had for this profession, leave them. It's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking to see we've spent holidays together, Christmas, New Year's, Thanksgiving, COVID, and they couldn't do it anymore. And you, you can't blame them for it either. You know, mental health needs to come first, but it's sad that we're at this point. And my final question. What are some of your take-home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience? I think my take-home message would be find an outlet, support each other. You don't know how much your work family means to you until they start to leave. And no one will ever be able to replace that bond. Mental health requires attention, especially in times like this. There are people that are going through what you went through, evidenced by the number of people and the reaction I got on this article, you know, you, even when you think you're alone, you're really not. So reach out to somebody you trust. Lauren, thank you so much for sharing your story, time and insight. And thanks again for being on the show. Thank you, Kevin.